So tonight, our agenda is shown here. We will review some key definitions related to health equity and healthcare equity. We'll also talk a bit about healthcare disparities research and how that translates to the healthcare system and how it translates to our quality and safety systems. And then we'll end with some question and answers. Thank you, Malcolm. Before we dive into today's presentation, we wanted to ground ourselves with some intention for the discussion. Malcolm and I really come to this conversation with the intention of increasing awareness around the inequitable state of healthcare today and to share our commitment to the right of every individual to experience health equity, which is the absence of disparities in both health as well as its determinants. Uncovering these inequities will require us to categorize populations by demographic characteristics. And we recognize that any system of categorization risks further stereotyping of community and the potential for further traumatization. So to mitigate these risks, we ground ourselves in an understanding that race is a social, political, and power construct that has very real consequences in clinical outcomes. At UCSF, we reject the claim that race is a biological concept. In today's conversation, we'll aim to better understand some of the drivers of these differences that uh, different groups experience in terms of their clinical outcomes, access, and experience. And again, we really commit ourselves to the work that it will take to advance equity for all communities. Malcolm, I'll turn it to you for our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Sarah. And so everyone, we would like to start, we would like to acknowledge the Ramatush Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramatush, Ramatush Ohlone elders, past, present, and future, who call this place the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatush Ohlone community for their stewardship and support. And we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Thank you so much for sharing our land acknowledgement, Malcolm. For those of you that might be uh, not yet familiar with the land acknowledgement, we wanted to just provide a little bit of brief background. So the land acknowledgement is a statement that expresses our gratitude and respect for those upon whose territories we live and work. It's important to note that these land acknowledgements are not simply about the land, but really are focused on honoring the people of these places. It reminds us of the history of how we came to reside in these places, as well as the ongoing processes that affect the relationships that we have with those communities. In turn, we hope that this will inspire both awareness as well as action to support the indigenous communities. This land acknowledgement is our UCSF land acknowledgement and was made in conjunction with the Office of Diversity and Outreach, the Native American Health Alliance, as well as the Native American Medical Students. So we really thank all of those teams for their important work. Malcolm, I'll turn it to you to share with us our learning objectives. Terrific, thank you. So our learning objectives for today include understanding key definitions related to healthcare equity. We also wanna appreciate the impact of healthcare disparities research and describe the translation of healthcare equity efforts to a health system, providers and staff and using UCSF as an example. We'll then transition to the translation of healthcare equity efforts to our quality and safety systems and practitioners, provide some resources for more learning and as I mentioned, more question and answers. So we'll start with key definitions. And here are the definitions we'll touch on today. I'll say first that we know we're not covering everything. And we know that there are multiple definitions that can be utilized, but we are landing on ones that have been supported by the Office of Diversity and Outreach here, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, RWJ for sure, the World, short, the World Health Organization or WHO, the CDC, Healthy 2020, um, Healthy People 2020 and others. And so on the left are the ones that I will review, health equity and how it differs from health care equity. We'll review a little bit on the social determinants of health and then how that is related to health inequities and end with health disparities and healthcare disparities. Sarah will walk us through stereotypes, microaggressions, bias, racism, systems of oppression and cultural competency before leading us into the next section. 
So what is health equity? Take a moment and just think about that. What is your answer for what health equity is? You got 10 seconds. Five, two, one, and here's my answer. Health equity is one that, where everyone has a fair and just, and by that we mean equitable, fair and just chance to reach the best health and optimal health. So how did that compare with your answer? Uh, to be fair, there is no universally accepted definition. This is the closest one, I think, to the Robert Wood Johnson version and one that many people land upon. And if you look at the diagram on the right, you'll see an image that is classic, that reflects the difference between equality, where everyone gets the same thing, and equity. So as you can see, we have three individuals of roughly the same height, the same potential, the same value, but they are standing on different levels of ground the opportunities that they are born into. And they are also facing different levels of defense or barriers that are preventing them from fully engaging and enjoying the game of life, which is on the other side. So equality says, well, everybody should get the same thing. So give them all a crate. But you'll see that that only results in the person on the left who had some advantage to begin with and less obstacles to fully enjoy the game of life. The person in the middle has to strain and stand up on their, on their tippy toe and eventually may get tired and have to try again and again. And the one on the right really can't see it all, maybe between the slats or in the hole. Equity says, let's give each one what they need to fully participate and enjoy in the game of life. So the one on the left gets one crate, the one in the middle two crates, the one on the, on the right three crates. The outcome is the same for all. And that is really the difference between equality and equity. And there are a couple of additional points I wanna make here. One is that even the person with opportunity needs potential assistance. Life is hard for everybody. So it's not about denying people support, but some others need additional supports given the situation or circumstances that they face because of societal structures based on their social or demographic or economic characteristics. Health equity is different than health care equity. Health care equity is a subset that really focuses on equitable, and remember that means fair and just, access, experience, and outcomes for every patient. And it's interesting because healthcare equity is definitely in the purview and wheelhouse of healthcare systems. That is not to say healthcare systems shouldn't participate in health equity, but we need to partner with other groups beyond health systems, the community, civic organizations, et cetera, to fully address health equity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But I think it's important to note that healthcare equity, being on the purview of the health system, doesn't mean it just is an organizational issue. It can often be very personal and frontline. And I'll give you an example. I remember when I was a junior doctor um, on 400 Parnassus and general medicine was next door, this um, woman came who identified as black, very professionally dressed, very upset and irate. And she started essentially yelling and demanding attention and support. And people were very nervous and they were grumblings and they were like, should we call security? Um, what, what's going on? And a medical assistant who herself identified as black took this woman and saw her distress really and had some empathy and took her into a room. And then the medical um, the nurse uh, manager on the floor who also happened to identify as black joined them. And they talked to her and what they found out is that her husband was suicidal and not calling his doctor and needed, and she wanted his psychiatric meds, re medications refilled immediately. And pharmacy had said, no, the prescription had run out, you gotta go to the clinic. And she was just getting a lot of runaround and was very upset and scared for her husband. And it turns out that that really wasn't what he needed. What he needed was immediate um, psychiatric attention, which of course um, the nurses were able to activate. And so that's an example where access was challenging. They were able to bridge that, help her have a positive experience and, essentially had a positive outcome, really saved her husband's life. And they were practicing essentially trauma-informed care before it was a thing. And so really that is a classic example of how we can impact healthcare equity. I wanna end here by saying healthcare equity plus equity in the greater, greater issues outside social determinants of health, which we'll talk about shortly, that leads to overall health equity. So pause here for a moment. moment. We're trying to achieve health equity, healthcare equity, which is under the purview, direct purview of the health system is a key component, but it is not sufficient to achieving health equity.
So what are these social determinants of health? Well, they're the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And you'll see in the first diagram from the Kaiser Family Foundation that there are seven, the classic diagram, okay? So there are six listed here, top row, starting from left to right. What are these determinants of health? Economic stability, employment, expenses, debt. Next is neighborhood and physical environment, a very big one, because you could be in an environment that's very toxic, a lot of toxic and pollution around, your lungs are maturing in that setting, you may not have transportation issues, you may not have open spaces to exercise. Education is the next one. Um, again, if you're in a neighborhood with low taxes, your school, public schools won't be well funded. Food, you can have a lot of food insecurity. Maybe there's not a lot of groceries in your neighborhood. Um, community and social contexts, of course. Community, social supports within the neighborhood, stresses within the neighborhood, and of course, healthcare system issues. All of this impacts in the orange at the bottom, health outcomes, mortality, um, basically death, morbidity, suffering, you know, um, illness or suffering, life expectancy, healthcare expenses, status, which is your overall health and functional limitations. And if we click on the next button, we'll see that unfortunately a lot of people not only have to deal with these social, um, uh, social determinants of health, but experience racism and discrimination that impacts across the board. And the effects of it is pervasive. And we could just simply look at it to the point that um, um, Black or African Americans pretty much have a health disparity in every illness in medical uh, in medical condition. And as Sarah pointed out, it's not about genetics, right? The human genome has been sequenced. There is no genetic explanation for uh, for race. It does not exist. Um, you may see some rare ge um, genetic associations, but overall, it's primarily driven by things like racism and discrimination. And we don't have to look far to see an example of that, right? So right here in the Bay Area, the toxic triangle, right? So you have Bayview Hunters Point with nuclear waste, you have um, Richmond with the all refinery race, uh, waste, and you have um, Oakland, the East Bay area with the ship, shipyards and their toxic waste. And guess what communities live in those areas? It's often black or uh, other people of color living in those areas and suffering the consequences that impact things like no groceries, et cetera. So this is really the bulk of what we have to deal with when we talk about equity. So related to the social determinants of health are health inequities. And so what are those? Well, those are the difference in overall health status and the distribution of health or healthcare resources between different populations related to their social determinants of health. And basically like equity is fair and just, inequities, are unjust and unfair, and usually can be addressed by like governmental policies and so forth. And often, unfortunately, they are not. Closely related is disparities. So health disparities are potentially avoidable differences in health status between populations closely linked to social advantage or disadvantage. And obviously that's uh, minoritized populations often related to race, ethnicity, gender, um, disability, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, so social, demographic, and economic factors. And again, slightly different from health care disparities on the right, which are also potentially avoidable. And the key here is that they're both potentially avoidable, so we can do something about it. But there are differences there in health care as opposed to health status between populations. You'll see that reductions in health disparities can be a very good measure of our progress towards achieving equity. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. We want to achieve health equity. One way to measure that is to look at how well we're doing with health disparities. And so if we go back to our original equation, for all you who do math, that's great. For those of you who don't do math, you're out of luck. Uh, actually, you don't really need math here, but it's, it's fun to play with equation type structure. But really, I talked about this earlier, right? So health care equity, access, experience, outcomes, plus equity in the social determinants, those economic, the neighborhoods, the um, uh, physical environment, community, health issues, et cetera, those six columns can yield health equity. But if we wanna flip it on its head a little bit, how do we know we're achieving healthcare equity? We're reducing healthcare disparities. How do we know we're achieving equity and social determinants of health? we're addressing those health inequities and, how, and that will lead to overall reduction of health disparities and health equity. So I hope this is a simplified view that is useful. 
But I do want to end on the next slide, on the next two slides, to point out something that people often miss, which is the difference between a health difference and a health disparity. So on the vertical axis, you will see quality of healthcare, and on the horizontal axis, you see two groups, non-minority group represented by the white column and a minority or really minoritized group in the blue. And I say minoritized because minority populations, well, you can still be in the majority and still be suffering um, from lack of, of um, influence or representation. And so with the minoritized population, you can see a difference in health outcomes. And that difference actually has three components. So the top one shows that there is a part of that difference that is related to clinical appropriateness and need, as well as patient preference. So what do we mean by that? So uh, patient preference, perhaps you belong to a religious group that doesn't believe in getting blood transfusions, and we respect that preference, but you may have outcomes that are worse because the blood transfusion might actually be helpful. But of course, we wanna respect that patient preference. Similarly, clinical appropriateness as well, if you see a difference and one group is older than the other, then that older group may have more infections that are appropriate for that older age group. Think about gentrified neighborhoods where a lot of young people have fled and older um, uh, populations, minoritized populations might exist and you may see that difference into happening here too. And in the middle, you'll see the, the one of the two causes of true disparities. So if you explain the top one away and you still have a difference, that's a disparity. And you can see the ecology of healthcare systems, meaning the organizations, the insurance, the access issues, and the environmental factors related to the social determinants. But I think one thing we miss is the one on the bottom, discrimination, biases, and stereotyping. And I think that that's really important for us to realize that that is a major contribution to healthcare disparities. In fact, Chancellor Hoggard had a speaker in May 6, 2021, Dana Bowen Matthew is a lawyer and a PhD whose whole premise and book is that essentially most if not all of health disparities is a result of biases in healthcare workers, providers, staff, et cetera. And you know, I can give a concrete example that may bring this home. And if you think about um, birthing units, okay? So if you were rich or if you're a, a rich non-minoritized person and you have your doula and your birthing plan and it includes no oxytocin, which is often required for birthing, people say they have a plan. But if you're perhaps a person of color, perhaps someone without money who didn't have a birthing plan in place or doula, and you get told you, you should have oxytocin and you don't want it because it makes you scared, you could be seen as a non-compliant patient. And of course, that then clouds how people see you and treat you. So I think it's really important for us to know that that is really something that healthcare workers and system need to address. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Sarah will walk us through that. And I'll end my section with this slide, which is a fishbone, starting on the right, racism in medicine and how it impacts our clear care. And I want to acknowledge that this comes from Dr. Jesse Ristow, Dr. Lamisha Hill, and Dr. Sarah Schaefer, all here at UCSF. And what they show is that there are three components, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and structural components that lead to racism in medicine. And on the top, you'll see defensiveness as one of the interpersonal um, that prevents you from moving forward, stereotype threat um, on the bottom that really contributes to that. And really those two then lead to an expression in how we interact with each other and our patients that can really affect care through the interpersonal implicit bias, next please, and microaggressions, next please. And of course, there are the greater structural issues, structural oppression, um, where we are arguing about equality versus equity or racism in medicine and power differentials that can lead to racism and poor outcomes. So with that, I'll transition to Sarah to talk a little bit more about some of these terms. Thank you. First, I want to overview the term of stereotype. So a stereotype is an overgeneralized belief about a particular category of people. And it is an expectation that people might have about every person of a particular group. The flip side of this is a stereotype threat, which some of you may have heard. Stereotype threat is the idea that often folks are aware of the stereotypes that another might have about their own community. And that sometimes those stereotypes have a deleterious effect of impacting that person and their own feelings about themselves and their actions. This concept actually frequently comes to us through education. Next, I'll introduce the concept of microaggressions. 
these are the everyday slights and invalidations that often occur between two people or a small group of people and disproportionately affect those that come from marginalized backgrounds. I want to emphasize that the use of the term micro does not reference that this is a minimal impact that this has. Micro is used to describe the system, which is a small system, an interpersonal or small group, as I mentioned. But the effect of these microaggressions can often be significant and is often cumulative, continually impacting historically resilient communities as they move about their day. Last brief note for you, you might hear me use the term historically resilient communities. I use that term instead of using terms like minoritized, marginalized, or disadvantaged, which are also appropriate terms to use. So next we'll talk about bias. Bias is a prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group. And it's usually considered to be unfair. It's important to remember that biases can be held not only by individuals, but by groups and institutions. And that biases not only negatively impact some individuals and groups, but they can also positively impact some groups. That means that sometimes they unfairly give advantage to some groups as compared to another. There's two common types of bias that are referenced. Conscious bias, which is also referred to as explicit bias, and unconscious bias, which you might hear referenced as implicit bias. The conscious bias are those things that we intentionally say about other individuals and other groups. These are maybe things that we have heard growing up and that we continue to propagate in the way that we talk about others. Here, I'll go ahead and teach you guys the concept of implicit bias. Those are those quote unquote unconscious biases, which is essentially meaning that this is something that someone may not say directly, they may not name that they have a bias about a group, but these are beliefs that we all have. These often come from the histories that we are taught, or more importantly, the histories that we are not taught, as well as our acculturation to this system. And it's important to remember that an integral part of our advancement in equity work is the personal work that we do to understand histories and stories much better and to be more aware and mindful of how we interact with others and how we think about them. That enables us to move more of these constructs from the unconscious to the conscious state. And when they are a part of our conscious awareness, that is when we are empowered to work on these things. So we must commit ourselves to not simply saying, well, it's unconscious, but to move those things into our consciousness. I wanted to review as well a key definition of racism. Here, what you'll see is the Center for De Disease Control, or also called the CDC's racism definition. They define racism as a system consisting of structures, policies, practices, and norms that assigns value based off of how someone looks. And again, the key here is that it both unfairly disadvantages and unfairly advantages some within our society. They emphasize that racism is not just structural and not just interpersonal. It happens on multiple levels. And really the key that you've seen from the Centers for Disease Control is a willingness to name what so many of us have known for so long, that racism is affecting the health of individuals and of our nation. It impacts both the mental and physical health outcomes. And that is why I believe you are seeing this much more open discussion that racism is a public health emergency. Again, these concepts have been known for many for a very long time, particularly amongst the activists within our community. And now I think that you are seeing some larger national institutions like the CDC, as well as many healthcare systems, also pulling up this conversation and naming its importance. I wanted to share with you just a little bit about how we think about systems of oppression, including racism here at UCSF. So this quote comes from Dr. Kamara Jones, who serves as our UCSF presidential scholar to advance equity. She defines racism as a structure of opportunity and assigning value based off of the social interpretation that unfairly 
disadvantages and advantages others. So similar to the CDC definition. However, what we think is so important about Dr. Jones's definition is this fourth part that it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Racism and other systems of oppression disproportionately affect those that are at its target. But in addition to that effect that they have for those communities, it affects all of us and it reduces our ability to succeed within our communities and in a much larger scale. These definitions can be applied not only to racism, but other systems of oppression. You might think about something like ableism, sexism, homophobia, and others. I wanted to walk through how these systems of oppression operate at multiple levels, the structural, institution, interpersonal, and internalized. I'll walk you through an example that might impact us here at the healthcare system. So let's say we have a woman of color who is going in for a preventative appointment. What we know is that women of color disproportionately work in roles that do not offer them paid sick leave to take that appointment. So there is already a structural barrier to accessing that preventative care. We also know that oftentimes women of color are operating in roles where they are not fairly and justly paid for the work and labor that they do. So perhaps transportation might be a challenge for this individual. Then at the institutional level, you might think about something like the health system's late arrival policy. We know the late arrival policy disproportionately affects people of color. Then from the structural to the institutional, we move to the interpersonal. Let's say that person has been spending a lot of time traveling on public transportation to get access to this very important preventative care visit. But when they show up, they have a negative interpersonal interaction. A front desk person maybe makes a comment to them, commenting on their tardiness to the appointment. These different layers create a compounding effect that unfortunately can also often result in internalized experiences of racism and systems of oppression. There may be bias against oneself, shame or frustration, and these cumulative effects have a macro scale on the health of people. Not only that individual access to the appointment, but their cortisol levels and experience of stress throughout the day. We'll now go into our next slide focused on our definition. Our final slide for definitions is we wanted to highlight the concept of cultural competence in healthcare. This is the ability for healthcare professionals to demonstrate an ability to understand that there are diverse values, beliefs, and feelings, and for them to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. Malcolm will help us better understand this concept a little bit later in the presentation. We'll now move from the key definitions section into our next section. And I'll talk to you a little bit about understanding healthcare disparities research. As I dive into this research, I do want to name that often before research starts, activism has started. And so much of the work that we are going to talk about that comes from the research or academic lens is really built upon the coalition building and community building that exists amongst, amongst our activists. What I want to highlight for you is some of the key reports that are often discussed when thinking about healthcare equity. So, first, in 1998, our Surgeon General David Thatcher released a series of reports that showed dramatic racial and ethnic disparities. Again, this work had been known by many for quite some time, but this report really elevated to the federal level. And at that time, our federal government was not frequently talking about the disparities within healthcare outcomes. In 2002, the Institute of Medicine then releases a really key report called the Unequal Treatment Report. Again, like the Surgeon General, this report notes the disparities for historically resilient communities and particularly draws out the conclusion that preventative medical treatment is less accessible and the quality of care received is also less than adequate. And one of the really key findings in this report is that oftentimes disparities were explained away from the idea of, well, it's about income, insurance status, 
comorbidity or the existence of multiple diseases at once that cause these differences. However, what this report showed is even when you standardize for these factors, that folks identifying as Black were experiencing worse clinical outcomes than their white counterparts. So we could not simply explain this away as a socioeconomic difference, but we as healthcare systems need to take ownership as being a part of this problem. So what we then see is we see a shifting um, by the Institute of Medicine to prioritize equity as a key list of aims for U.S. healthcare systems. They had previously defined that high quality care meant that you had to be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, and efficient. And because the Institute of Medicine is such an important body in our healthcare system, there was a lot of focus in those areas. But equity was not at the table. So they ended up adding this aim and defining it as providing care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics. Well, let's see what happened next. So what we see in 2010, Institute of Medicine comes back to release a report. They said, we've defined equity as a key priority. How are folks doing? This report is referred to as how far have we come in reducing health disparities. And unfortunately, what you see is very little progress has been made. And what it results in is coining this term of the forgotten aim, the aim that is so often not achieved. So let me give you an example of how that happens. This graph on the right describes life expectancy. In the gray bar, you'll see the life expectancy for those identifying as white. And in the red bar, you'll see the life expectancy for those identifying as black. What you'll see is over time, we've improved our life expectancy. There's been medical advances. There's been that focus on timely care, patient-centered care, high quality and very safe care. But despite that focus, what we see is that the disparity persists. So even though Americans are living longer, that benefit is not equitably received by those that are identified as Black. So we need to ensure that equity is up front at the table, otherwise we will not close these disparities. I also wanna highlight for the group that these identities and disparities work on an intersectional lens. So intersectionality is the concept that multiple forms of inequality can be operating together based off of an individual, multiple identities. On this slide, in the dotted line in orange, you'll see the activation for my chart for Asian identifying people. My chart activation is an important way to stay engaged with your clinical care team, to get access to self-scheduling appointments and other tools. However, what you'll see in the dotted orange line is the rates for those that are both Asian identifying as well as speaking a language other than English. So we see the, the, the compounding way that these intersectional identities create worse outcomes for those that are both Asian and prefer a language other than English, a 15% differential. And what we see in the purple is the outcomes amongst Latinos, dotted purple for Latinos that prefer English as their chosen language, the dashed line for those that prefer another language. And you see a dramatic disparity that's created for those that are both Latino identifying and speaking a language other than English, resulting in worsening disparities for this community. So you might ask me, Sarah, what are the drivers for these healthcare disparities? And I'm gonna pull up one of the concepts that Malcolm reviewed for us, that healthcare disparities are driven by social and economic inequities. So that might be something like Economic stability, do you have a fair and just access to employment and, and income? Educational opportunities, food insecurity in your neighborhood, as well as those labeled here in green, the healthcare system. What sort of insurance coverage do you have? Can you access a local pharmacy in your area? And it's important to note that these areas are not hindered because of a lack of valuing these important areas like education, or healthy access to food. These are not accessible to all communities in the same way because of an intentional system that has structured opportunities for some and structured disadvantages and barriers for others. 
And so what we've seen in public health research is that this healthcare system piece accounts for about 10 to 20 percent of the modifiable, modifiable contributors to health. You might ask me the question, well, Sarah, if it's only 10 to 20 percent, then why are you working in a healthcare system? Why aren't you moving upstream and in, in focusing on education? That's an important question. All of these areas need transformational change within our culture and our communities to advance equity. And I have a personal interest within the health equity space. I really enjoy working within a health system, and I was really curious to understand what role we could play to do better. And some of the research that's come out has been very interesting in this area, that even when you standardize for socioeconomic status, which we talked about in the Institute of Medicine's report, that we still see a difference. In this slide, what you'll see is the outcomes for pregnancy-related deaths. And what we find is that even when standardizing for socioeconomic status, that higher education attainment actually has exacerbated rather than mitigated disparities for Black identifying people in terms of maternal death outcomes. So overall, Black people experience a three times higher rate than their white counterparts of pregnancy-related death. However, for a Black mother who is college-educated, that rate is five times as high as their white counterpart. And not only do they have a higher chance of pregnancy-related death, but their chance is higher than that of a white mother who has less than a high school education. So even when we standardize for socioeconomic difference, we know that disparity persists, and we know that we within the healthcare system have an important role to play in navigating that. I'll now pass it back to Malcolm so that he can help us better understand how the healthcare system, we are translating these concepts into our care, both amongst providers and staff. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that discussion. And Sarah raised the point, how do we translate what this history and the research into action? And it's not often easy, right? It isn't easy at all. And I think it's one of the reasons why it is the forgotten pillar. But there are some roadmaps out there, including this one from the um, Advancing Health Equity Group, formerly new, known as Finding Answers, that, that was founded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, RWJ, in 2005. And, and that group really exists to help bring alignment among key stakeholders, government, uh, payers or insurance companies, um, enrollees in insurance, communities, patients, et cetera, to align efforts to reduce um, health disparities and advance health equity. The six steps are look uh, here, but I wanna to go to the next slide and really kind of talk through them a little bit. Step one is essentially making that connection between quality and equity, and Sarah did a wonderful job of introducing that um, for us. Step two is really changing your culture and creating a culture of equity within your organization through mission and vision statements, also by bringing patient voice, whether it's a patient family advisory council, a PFAX or community advisory board like a CAB, and really assessing your organizational culture and influencing it. And here at UCSF, we just um, started, um, just have uh, uh, hired or created a new role, executive advisor for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging that is helping us kind of work through our internal culture. And um, that is Dr. Maja jackson Treach. Um, and then we have diagnosing disparities. What are the disparities that exist in your institution, neighborhood, and communities? And that involves the routine data analysis, but it also involves really talking to fam your community, patients, families, and communities about what they're experiencing in terms of access, care, and outcomes. The outcomes piece, there's a lot of more information, but the other piece we don't often ask. We utilize focus groups, um, often in partnerships with community groups that are deeply involved in the community and discuss, create a space for sensitive topics in a safe environment and doing a lot around patient feedback and patient experience. The last three steps is really then based on all of this, what sort of activities are you gonna design and implement, really making sure you have buy-in. And traditionally the buy-in has been more internal, like with you know who needs to do this and who needs to do that, but it's increasingly, uh, uh, the awareness is increasingly high but you need to really get a lot of buy-in, not only from patients who are coming here, but their care team around them, and also the community in which they live. And that uh, has been really exploding 
since the events of George Floyd and, and COVID-19, although it was building um, quite a while before that as well with some wonderful activity, both internally and externally. And of course, you wanna make sure that you evaluate what are your true metrics and reevaluate at all times. So here at UCSF, we sort of started a health equity council to help us kind of strategize around this. And of course, we men I mentioned that we hire, have now hired an executive advisor for DIB. We now have a, a medical director of health equity, a program director of health equity, and a myriad number of key leaders across this campus. And I have to say, it's it's a it's a broad enterprise and effort needed to move this, and no one person or persons can do this. But the Health Equity Council plays the central role. I just wanted to kind of set up a framing for that work, and just to show that um, this is sort of a framework that Sour created to help us think about the various levers needed to advance health equity and anti-racism work at UCSF Health. It includes but we know it's not necessarily limited to the domains that are shown here. You'll see that the Health Equity Council really focuses on the top layer quality, language access, access to care, patient experience, patient engagement, and clinical outcomes. But we know it is our role to work with and partner across the other domains, and we do so. And many of those key leaders from those domains sit on the Equity Council, and they cover system, system, uh, systemic issues um, such as our policies, uh, environmental issues, such as our um, public safety um, uh, protocols, the culture, when people come here, do they see people who look like them? And more upstream elements, groups that have really taken off working with community to partner around addressing the social determinants of health and so on. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the Health Equity Council. And you know, basically the Health Equity Council was established to make sure that health equity stays as a strategic and operational priority for UCSF Health. And we started off having it activated by the Dean's Office School of Medicine Differences Matter Clinical Health Equity Action Group. And that group reached out to then um, Chief Quality Officer Nerit Sagal and Executive Population Health Director um, Kevin Grumbach, who really ran with it and helped get it established by the UCSF Health Executive Leadership Committee in 2018, with the specific purpose of leading, inspiring, advocating, influencing, and communicating um, all things related to health equity for UCSF Health System. And our main scope is four right now, culture and awareness as it pertains to health equity, but also data and analytics, how we analyze our data, making sure we have standards that we're all talking about the same thing when we're talking about different racial groups or sexual orientation and identity groups and making sure all our data forms can utilize that um, uh, an analytic capability and then use that to help us with disparities improvement work as Sarah outlined, like hypertension control or diabetes control. And importantly, to make sure health equity is a key part of the strategic vision of UCSF. And the Health Equity Council has about 20 members. Um, it's really health systems operational and functional leads, diversity experts, or excuse me, health disparities experts, and representation from Benioff Children's, Z, um, San Francisco General Hospital, and San Francisco VA. So all the clinical entities are represented. It's housed within the Department of Quality and Safety, which I think is a critical part, so that we can tap into the rich um, quality improvement science that exists in quality and safety and the history uh, that led to its development. And it is within the organizational structure. So it's not an ad hoc committee, it's a permanent part of UCSF. And importantly, our executive sponsor is our chief medical officer who attends the meeting frequently. So the Health Equity Council is not the center of the universe around health equity for the health system. It is, it really does take a village. And so this is really to show how we relate to all the different components. And if you click next, You'll see that starting with the purple box, we have alignment with health equity and DI leads at other campuses, including the Health Equity Council has an annual strategy meeting with many of children's and moving clock clockwise, we touch bases with uh, alignment with the executive advisor who sits on our board and in the bottom right, really alignment with key task force and other groups, including the Chancellor anti Chancellor's anti-racism task force. So I wanted to start off and talk about the Health Equity Council or HEC highlights. And you'll see over the next slide, on the top will be highlights um, from prior to 2020 and below highlights uh, after 2020. And on the starting with culture and awareness right here, 
we see that we really spent a lot of time sharing our vision with key leaders. We had leadership retreats. We published an equity report to really start to get the community acculturated to this work, especially the leaders to get their buy-in. And more recently on the bottom, we did a health equity inventory, which I'll talk a little bit about to really get a roadmap of what's happening at, at the campus. We advocated for some um, strategy themes and the data and analytics piece. We really did much of that through our subcommittee, the Data Equity Task Force, which worked with population health to develop new race, ethnicity standards and definitions that are rolled out across our major dashboards. And we're doing the same advocacy for sexual orientation and gender identity. And at the bottom, you'll see that we partnered with Health Informatics and roll this out into the COVID equity dashboard. It's also in our patient experience dashboard and a number of key reports listed below. And next you'll see on the right that our main focus, ultimate focus is improving health and disparities improvement work. And so we've gotten our health equity goals or metrics on the enterprise True North scorecard. And what that means, that is the guiding um, prince, the guidance of what we're all going to work towards as the entity, as that health entity. So it's really important that we have visibility on that board. We started off with hypertension and we expanded to five over the past year. That includes COVID, flu, hypertension, advanced care planning, and remote visits. We have a disparities improvement task force where all the groups working on these priorities can come and learn best practices, share experiences. I think a lot of people started using patient-based um, focus groups um, a lot more because they learned about the successes in others. And we have a social determinants of health task force, which has started to really look at how we're looking at social determinants and um, making recommendations on how best we take action and want to give them a shout out because they've done a lot of great work. So the health equity inventory was really um, done this year to help us kind of have clarity on the range and scope of major initiatives across UCSF that impact health equity, and also to kind of build in some alignment and efficiencies. And I just want to highlight in the top row there that we had over 120 submissions, most of which were started in 2020. And importantly, 79 of 120 had significant internal and external collaboration. So it's really reflecting deep tentacles across the campus and across the Bay Area. In the bottom side, we see the domains that Sarah had outlined for us, represented by these different colors. And all you need to take home is pretty much every domain is represented. We don't have education represented here because they're doing amazing and deep work that could not be captured here. So work by uh, Catherine Lucy's office, John Davis, Denise Kahn, and Michelle Guy, Amy Medeiros, and so many others in creating an, an anti-racist uh, um, curriculum for our, our trainees. I like this graphic here because it really shows the number of projects that were started each year, starting about 2015. And you'll see four, two, four, six. And then there was kind of this trend, like from four to six to 10 in 2019, and an explosion in 2020. And I think this really speaks to the, the main thing I get from this is that there seems to be this trend in our culture at UCSF where people are really digging into this work. And, and I hope it's um, persist. And it's really exciting to think of that. And I'll end with where, again, these are the clinical entities that make up UCSF Health on the left. And again, it's just to show that every entity has one or more major initiatives. I will point out that in addition to not capturing education, we did not capture the very rich and important grassroots efforts. These were like major efforts being done by leaders uh, across the campus. And so we had a retreat related to this session, and I wanted to share some of the key talking points. So the, the themes and practices are first, walk the talk. And really folks wanted leadership, wanted to push and advocate that leadership needs to continue to make this a priority and importantly to resource it, um, both with funds and, and, and person power and to recognize people who are doing this work. So there's no more health equity tax. Next, they also wanted us to center patient and family voices to make sure that we're asking them what their experience is like, what do they want, what should we be prioritizing, and even the Health Equity Council, how do we get that voice into our Health Equity Council on a regular basis? Next, we wanted to make sure that health equity remains a priority in our strategic vision as we roll out and expand to multiple affiliates across the Bay Area, getting a footprint into multiple communities. How can we make sure that those affiliates are including health equity as a priority and making sure that we actually get to learn more about these communities and in addition to creating more access. 
And we wanted to make sure that we incorporate health equity into our day-to-day -day core operations. And lastly, they really wanted to make sure that we spread and sustain this, that this isn't some one-off. I did wanna do next the spotlight that there, that there was an emphasis that really emerged organically within that group that we should be focusing on language access, patient engagement, and people development at that, you know, the diversity within our own organization and the promotion of such people. And then lastly on this slide, I wanted to point out that something that really our executive sponsor um, helped us think about was what are, should be our next steps? And there were two main highlights. One is that we should be really influencing the work or how might we influence the work to align with broader health equity trends across the nation and importantly, locally, right? And really how do we engage our community to understand the needs um, here? And two, how do we know we're being successful? How can we measure effectiveness? It's an important question and one that we don't fully yet know short of actually reducing disparities, which as Sarah pointed out, a lot of it's related to social determinants of health. So how do we really know we're making progress? So that's how organizations can organize itself, to use that doubly, um, but what can healthcare individuals do? And I wanna pause for a moment on this slide because it shows White Coats for Black Lives, a group that originated after Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. And it was really that series of protests that led Dean King to change his strategic retreat and really led to focus on this um, issue, racism and, and health uh, equity and disparities. And really that led to the five-year Differences Matter initiative that ultimately led to many things, including this Health Equity Council. So the power of the individual should not be estimated and the power of individual health providers, staff and workers should not be underestimated. So what can we do? Well, we can start with first, DI training and personal work. Start that foundational journey. It's really important ways that we can support each other, our colleagues, patients, and our ability to sustain this work. It's important to do it and it can be life-saving. Sarah mentioned, the mortality of black pregnant women and their fetuses. And you know, that is really ameliorated when they have black providers. And it doesn't have to be that only black providers increase the mortality, uh, decrease the mortality and increase the wellness of pregnant women and their fetuses. So that journey has to start, deal with implicit bias, et cetera. It is essential, um, this work is essential to benefiting all businesses know the importance of diversity to innovation, productivity, profitability, and excellence. And that's been well studied. And really next from that is really addressing implicit bias. And that's shown here where we make the unconscious conscious. We should start by learning our own biases. We all have it. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. You might be a bad person, but it's not necessarily from that. I'm just kidding. But you know, but you know, you could take the Harvard Implicit Association test online. It could be around race. They have multiple categories, race, gender, et cetera. So I would encourage all to do that because awareness is the path towards decreasing it. And when I sit on admissions committees or reviewing an application or a job hunt, I even speak up and I say, you know, I may have, I have, may have an affinity bias for this applicant because they are from my, my town or they went to my college or et cetera. So it's okay to have that, um, to, to acknowledge that rather and acknowledging it decreases it. The other one is the challenge automaticity. Implicit bias is sort of, you kind of go on autopilot. So slow down, okay? When you, you know, slow down and be mindful and be objective. And also be objective by counting and doing a self audit. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, look at how many people you've hired, promoted, um, wrote evaluations for good, bad, and, and not at all. And how many of them were women? How many of them were people of color? How did they do? You know, how many were able-bodied folks or disabled, uh, um, handicapped folks? Um, uh, folks with disability, my apologies. Um, so, you know, I, again, I think it's important that we um, uh, think of all of these. And then lastly, we want to challenge stereotypes and really learn individual stories and characteristics. And it's important to look out for confirmation bias. So when you kind of get to know a person, don't ignore the five great things they have and one thing that confirms a previous stereotype. It's really important to be aware of that and do stereotype replacement and say, would I have responded the same way if this woman were a man, this person of color were white, et cetera, and make sure um, that we also be intentional in our use of language when we write letters of evaluation or recommendations. Um, lastly, I will say that you should engage your teams, 
or whether you're a manager or part of a team looking at key variables or metrics, um, Sarah's group can help us with that. Um, you should always use um, language interpreter services and other tools that enhance patient experiences. And next, I want to encourage folks to take the health equity pledge to educate yourself, advocate for health equity and anti-racism, and to take action, whether it's small or large in each of these groups. We do have a health equity pledge page as part of Differences Matter. I wanna make a plug for that. You can just Google UCSF health equity pledge. The link is also there on the slide and you will have that information. And it gives you a wonderful, on the resource pages, some information, additional definitions, but also examples in Educate Advocate Act that are easy, medium, and high complexity. So you can do that as well. And I'll end my section by focusing on um, the connection between um, anti-racism and health equity. And basically, just to go back to the previous discussion that health equity equals promoting health care equity, right? Health care equity under the purview of the health system and decreasing health-related inequities, those social determinants for less advantaged populations or resilient populations related to social or demographic factors. And they're all listed here, but I wanna point your attention out that one of them, the, the very last one is age. And hopefully all of us will get to a point where we're older, but we're also entering a risk group, right? It is, and the COVID pandemic actually shows you that ageism is real. And so this is important to all of us, no matter who you are. And with respect to race specifically, this is how we connect to the anti-racism movement and goals of the chancellor's office. With respect to race specifically, this is the same as promoting racial healthcare equity or racial equity and decreasing racial health inequities or racial inequities. And if you pay attention to Ibrahim Kendry, that itself is an anti-racist act, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist. So with that, I'll transition to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malcolm. So in our next section, we will be talking a bit about how healthcare equity translates to quality and safety systems and those of us that work within this space. I will try to move through these slides fairly quickly just because I know that we're getting a lot of great questions and we want to have time for that. So as Malcolm mentioned, translating healthcare equity to quality and safety is one of the six steps that are considered key to advancing this work. In order to create this connection between equity and quality and safety, there's five key steps that we've named here at UCSS. One is advancing equity-related variables. An equity-related variable is essentially a variable that can be used to understand how different subpopulations might be experiencing access, experience, or clinical outcomes to our care. So that might be something like understanding an individual's race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, and other categories. Then what we do is once we understand our patient population, we're able to integrate that into an equity analysis where we ask the question, is there a disproportionate burden for this community? And then we really focus on understanding and doing data interpretation. As Malcolm mentioned, a disparity is a specific type of difference. It is a difference that we see over time. It is a difference that we can attribute to an individual's identity factors, and it is unjust. So how do we work with our data to understand those differences? We then move into activating a disparity improvement. For many years, we've done quality improvement work, safety improvement work. And now what we are trying to say is, we know a lot about quality improvement science, design thinking, how to have a highly reliable healthcare organization. How do we orient that, those skills and those resources specifically to disparities and target this work to ensure that not only does that life expectancy increase, but that it increases in an equitable manner for all members of our community. And then we focus on creating sustainability within our operations to ensure that this isn't just a flavor of the week, but this is how we do things and how we expect all of those within our healthcare system to operate. I'm going to go ahead and walk us through a couple quick examples about this information. So as I mentioned, that first step is advancing the equity-related variable capturing information. So some of you may have seen this either providing care or receiving care. You might be asked about demographics, 
like your self-identified race and ethnicity or social determinants of health, like your food insecurity. What we hope we can do with this information is inform culturally competent care. How might understanding that someone has limited uh, mobility in terms of their ability status affect the type of physical therapy that you assign them? And then how do we think about this at the equity analysis level, at the population level? How do we understand how, for example, tobacco cessation is reaching or not reaching certain communities? And it's important to remember that we support your privacy with this information. All of this information is considered HIPAA compliant, which means that it's protected at the highest level. And we support your choice to opt out of these services or to ask members of your care team, how might this information be used? Or I don't understand this question, can you help me understand? So here I want to show us how we're integrating this work into equity analysis, specifically discussing our COVID work. So very soon after the pandemic took off, we started working as a system to create publicly displayed equity analysis so that we could not only promote transparency, but also promote open discussion about healthcare disparities. And what we saw in that third column amongst Latinos is that while Latinos were about one out of 10 of our patients and were being tested at a rate of about um, one in five, they still experienced positivity and hospitalization of more than one out of three of our patients. That means that this group was experiencing a disproportionate burden. So we had to activate disparity improvement. So what you'll see here is the comparison between test positive rates. And you'll see that what we really organized ourselves around is how do we support Latinos to ensure that we reduce this disproportionate burden? This includes things like mailing out postcards to ensure folks understood the signs and how to access testing, ensuring that our website is available in Spanish, and doing targeted calls in multiple languages to support this community and ensure that they had a close connection to us here at UCSF and understood how they could advance their own care. And what we saw is we saw this really interesting trend. In the bottom, you'll see our blue line, which is testing amongst those identifying as Latino. Once we started our intervention, that dashed orange line, you'll see that that number started to go up. And in our orange line, which is how many of our proportion of folks are identifying as COVID positive amongst Latinos, started going down. Increasing testing resulted in a decreasing um, positive, likely because we're helping folks catch and, and understand their COVID status earlier. We're helping them to understand how they might isolate, for example, and also helping them understand community resources to be able to engage in that behavior. I briefly want to mention a hypertension example. In our hypertension work, we saw a disparity amongst Black identifying individuals. This is a known disparity, exists across many different health systems. And so we focused on plugging in a healthcare navigator into this work to really give one-to-one -one care between visits, calling folks, building a relationship, doing ongoing outreach, ensuring that everyone has access to a blood pressure cuff and understands how to utilize that tool. And we received wonderful results. Patients telling us that this really supported their care and helped them understand the care that they needed and engage. What we saw is in the gray line, we see all patients blue, we see those that are identifying as black. All patients were hindered by the pandemic, less access to care, less engagement. However, with targeted efforts starting at the beginning of this year, we improved blood pressure management, but not only did we improve it, but we decreased the disparity. There is ongoing work that is necessary to continue this improvement and to take it to the next level. However, we were really proud of our ability to not only drive improvement, but specifically to create interventions designed for targeting the needs of Black patients as we heard them from Black patients, which we engaged in thinking about where to focus our attention. So you might say, Sarah, I still don't understand. What is your job? That is totally okay. 
quality and safety is a really unique space, and it's not always a space that folks understand well. So here's just a quick sample schedule. So if we think about some of my work, it might be working with our subject matter experts that are thinking about how do we advance capturing sexual orientation information and asking those questions or working with our diabetes management team in the pediatric setting to understand what interventions do we design so that we can advance um, the care for those that are publicly insured, which we know have a disparity. I wanna highlight that the quality and safety space is often a space that is dominated by advantaged identities. If you or a family member might be interested in getting into this space, please don't hesitate to reach out. We would really love to see more diverse lived experiences and academic backgrounds, and we here in Quality and Safety are really eager to work with you. So consider it and feel free to reach out. This slide highlights some additional information, some videos and podcasts to learn more about the topics Malcolm and I have shared. These will be made available in the summary. And then our last slide here, I wanted to thank the activists, again, that have worked in this space. On the left, you'll see a photo for the Black community organizing around advancing sickle cell anemia. On the right, you'll see those that identify within the LGBT community that have organized and advocated around ending the AIDS epidemic. This work is founded upon by activism that is then transcended into research and is moved into the health system. And I wanna thank all of those that have contributed to this expertise. Thank you for your time and I'll turn it over to Alejandra for our Q&A. Thank you, Sarah and Malcolm. Wonderful presentation. Thanks to both of you. We've had a fair amount of interaction here in the q and A. I wanna start with a very general question. How can we engage with colleagues who are in denial about the impact of race? So I either one let, of you can take that one. Yeah, I think I'll let Sarah handle the softball of a question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, I think there are several, one is the work has to proceed. So continuing to do the work, standardize the work, you know, sometimes people have to be, have to, um, act their way into a belief. So making it a standard part of our day-to-day -day operations, whether you believe it or not, this is patient quality, this is individuals we're taking care of. And I appreciate the comment in the chat about these aren't numbers, these are individual stories, which is why I thought it was important to share individual stories and experiences that bring home the message that whether you're on the front line or a senior leader, this is something you need to be a part of and you contribute to. And so I think standardizing what we do around equity, holding people accountable, making sure their incentives are, and bonuses are tied to it. Um, you know, I had one senior physician say to me, you know, everything I do is basically anything that is part of the clinical protocol. So, you know, making sure that it gets down to the front line, um, making sure leaders are held accountable. Um, so I think that that's where we start. Where we advance is continuing to educate whole town halls, um, informationals, bring people along this journey so that others start to become voices um, uh, you know, it shouldn't be a few people. This needs to be a community journey. Um, so I think that that's how we continue to work and move this forward and to bring in voices from the community so people understand. And I, I, I saw and I felt the comment about pain, that people understand the pain that you can cause when someone comes here in need and they go into a busy emergency room and they're hearing and being re-traumatized by what's happening around them, even if it's not happening directly to them, it's happening to them. And so I think that's where, um, uh, uh, you know, this is, this, is a, this is the start. That's how we start this journey. And I don't know if Sarah wanted to add to that or not, but we have other questions, I know, so. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, and thank you to our community members uh, for being engaged, for being very lively on the chat, for giving us feedback. Uh, this next question uh, for Dr. from Dr. Monique Lessar, head of the Rafiki Coalition. Dr. John, thank you for your talk. What about epigenetics, intergenerational trauma, and the interplay with adverse childhood experiences and social determinants of health? Can you share your views on how this impacts health equity? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think the slide from with the social determinants with racism across all, this, all the columns is really to show 
that it's a massive impact. So let's just talk about some examples. You know, Dr. Nita Thacker here is a pulmonologist who really focuses on sort of the population, uh, uh, the, the effects of one's experience over a lifetime, the environment on lung development and lung health. So you can imagine that as a young person growing up in an environment with lots of pollution or toxin, as your lungs are maturing in that environment, it's not going to mature in the same way as someone who's running around in a pollution-free zone, gets to go to the park every Sunday and, and, and kick ball and so forth in a different environment. And so um, it affects your environment. That is epigenetic. And that's, that's one of the effects. The other is chronic stress of racism. So, you know, there are studies, there was one that was done in 2018, I think it was right after um, George, uh, the, um, but anyway, the, 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 it was after a shooting that shows that individuals in a community who witness a, 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 a um, police shooting of a person of color, a black uh, male or woman, um, in particular, we're looking at the black community, that whole community is traumatized and mental health goes down. Okay, so every day as a person of color, you're experiencing microaggressions and the effects of biases. It's the cut by a thousand knives. And that chronic stress can impact your DNA. That's epigenetics, right? That chronic stress, you know, it's one of the theories of like hypertension differences between um, Black Americans and other populations where we can't find a gene. Yeah, and yes, it's part of it is food. Yes, part of it is this, but part of it is that chronic cortisol stress and how it gets embedded. So, and that impacts cardiovascular health, mental health, uh, multiple, I mean, disparities exist in the black community in every category for a reason. And it doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. So it's not just about, oh, people will say it's insurance or this. No, think about the physician who was in um, the ER right, with COVID and transmitting her experience in the ER and ultimately died of COVID, felt was not well treated in the ER, was admitted to the hospital, discharged, in her opinion, too early, and ended up dying of COVID. Um, so yes, we can go on, but I'll stop there. And I hope that answered Monique's question. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second, uh, Malcolm, as you talked about and you've mentioned uh, white coach for Black Lives. I want to obviously uh, not just make a reference to it, but really honor um, the men who were the reason for that organization to come alive. And so you talked about Michael Brown and Eric Gardner, and it was the decisions of those grand juries not to indict the police officers, which prompted the students at UCSF and 80 other medical schools to form white coach for black lives. So I, I do want to pause for a second to mention their names uh, because we're not doing this in a vacuum. We, we remember them and their names. Um, you sparked a lot of interest with the comments you and um, Sarah about um, no changes uh, or you know no changes in black morbidity uh, for women um, African American women who are um, have you know a certain degree of education and so we have a question here from uh, Hannah and it, it is a bit long so I'm just going to read a portion of that. Has there been any research about a reduction of black maternal morbidity in providers identifying as other races? In research, how can we measure provider respectfulness, cultural competency, and emotional intelligence that might feed into better patient outcomes? Of course, it's critical for Black identifying people to be represented in medicine. And I am wondering how I, as a white identifying future provider, can do no harm and actually help. So thank you, Ahana, for that. Wow. Uh, and uh, please help us with that. Thank you. So to the first part of the question, yes, there is research that shows that concordancy of shared lived experiences and identities amongst providers and patients does reduce um, disparities that we see. This exists not only in maternal outcomes, but we also see research in other areas. Malcolm and I are really trying to pursue a dual strategy which is that we are advocating for the system to continue to invest in building the pipeline to diversify providers so that providers look like those that we serve have a shared cultural and lived experience. In addition, we also know that we have to help and support other providers in providing more culturally competent care. And to your question, Hannah, how we do that 
often remains a question. There are some studies that demonstrate some improvement based off of strategies. There's even some work right now around virtual reality, for example, as a tool to potentially advance that. Malcolm and I try to lend towards storytelling as a way to really describe the effect. However, we are still trying to figure out as a health system, how do we narrow that gap and create more culturally competency, even if it is outside your own lived experience. And I think spending your time in groups like this is one of the tools. Continuing to advance your own internal work around equity is a really important foundation for you to be able to build and better understand. And lastly, I would say lift up the voices of others. Oftentimes, we don't see as much diversity, for example, at the physician level, but we tend to see more diversity at the nursing level, at the staff level. Think about how you can call in those voices, whether it's into a meeting or discussing patient care, and raise up those voices that are already here at our institution. Malcolm, please feel free to add. Now, I just want to second what you said and just speak to the importance of diverse teams so that if you have a diverse team around you and you're reviewing what's happening in your clinic or your units, that's gonna help those diverse voices highlight things that you may miss. I think if you're on the journey and doing the self um, learning and uh, 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 that is going on and supporting and lifting others um, and knowing to not always step forward, but sometimes you need to step back and listen, that means engaging your patients, being uh, curious, um, about their experiences and really practicing trauma-informed care, I think all of those things will help. So it's, it does not and should not be just race concordant providers that does this work. It's, it's, it can be done, sorry. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Malcolm. And we have a number of questions around accountability. So I'm gonna post this one because it's come up a couple of times. What systems are in place at UCSF to hold colleagues accountable who are in denial or quote, unaware, end of quote, about their racism, bias, and microaggression behavior? Well, I don't know of any ac accountability in the sense of punitive, if that's what people are asking, unless you violate um, you know, national standards. I mean, your office, uh, Alejandra, deals with that. So if, there, if, it, if it meets the level, um, then there are um, requirements for reporting um, discrimination um, uh, and so forth. But short of that, I think at this point, we don't have a punitive process. I, I, you know, I, I, I would defer to um, our executive advisor, Marja Jackson Trees, because I think this is an area where we're, we're working on our internal environment. I think her input with our new roles, with the incoming chief quality officer, with ultimately Renee and your office, Alejandra, as we develop that executive council around DEI, these are the kind of questions that, the, that are an, evo these are the groups that are an evolution of the chancellor's anti-racism task force. These are the kind of things we'll need um, some higher level um, policies to address. So it's a great question. Um, you know, we always wanna start with carrots first, sticks to follow. Um, so let's, you know, I think we're moving forward in the right direction, but yeah, I don't know if, that's helpful, but. It is, thank you, uh, Malcolm. And, and yes, there are processes for violations of um, cases of race, um, discrimination and, and violations of protected categories that come to our office for the prevention of harassment and discrimination. Okay, we have a few minutes left. I wanna ask, there's a great question about any publications you can recommend about the effects of internalized bias on patients. For example, for patients who have somehow internalized this message that they don't deserve quality care, and therefore accept poor and uninterested interactions and treatment plans from their care team? Thank you. That's a great question. I don't have any on the top of my head, but can easily get those. I know that um, on ODO's resource page are tips on how to protect yourself during um, episodes of, of racism, both for providers and allies and others. Um, but I think um, we can certainly point you in that right direction. So maybe we can take that person's name and send them some resources specifically, unless Sarah has some direct resources that she'd recommend off the top of her head. There definitely are some resources. 
one that I think might be um, interesting, which I'll place in the chat, is there was um, a recent book that was published, um, and I will have to write the name in the chat for you, that focuses on understanding the history of fat phobia through the lens of racism. And it does touch a fair amount on this concept of how we have sometimes accepted these external views about ourselves and about our bodies and the pain that that propagates for how we see ourselves. Um, that may be an interesting read, and, and, and I'll populate that in the chat momentarily. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I think I'm going to post one more question. I know we are at, at time, but just one more question. Has UCSF contributed to the ongoing efforts to end race-based metrics with regards to kidney function, such as EGFR? And the answer, short answer is yes. Um, I would first point people to um, Kirsten Vivens Domingo's Race and Medicine series on the UCSF website. There, there was a wonderful series of conversations around the use of race in medicine. But with regards to EGFR, for example, we had several leaders um, at, at ZSFG, um, Vanessa Grubbs and others um, who uh, really advocated for this and really our kidney team specialists, neuro nephrologists here, um, uh, Chi Su, chief here, um, here at Parnassus, Neil Poe, um, um, department chair, um, um, Dr. Delgado at the VA, uh, I think Dr. Poe and Dr. Delgado, Cynthia Delgado, were the leads on the National Kidney Foundation's um, new standards, and they just published several articles in the England Journal around that. Locally, well before they had published those standards, um, as I mentioned, there were some initiatives here. We changed EGFR here at UCSF Health, took out the race equation, and really just reported a high and low value, and really emphasizing, again, what someone emphasized in the chat about people being people, that you need to look at your individual in front of you and determine whether the high or lower value is appropriate and not just say, oh, you're black, so you go with the higher value. Well, you know, is that is that correct or not? So I think um, now nationally, they have come up with some race free um, recommendations that will become a national standard. Um, and I'm proud to say that UC was ahead of that curve. And um, one of my new new jobs as in my new role is to help us, according to the CMO, to kind of think of how we can partner with others to come up with a, a more consistent protocol or process to do this more. Because Sarah gets a lot of emails around this. You know, I get calls around this and we've been dealing with this. I will say our IT team have been, there's a group that's been going through all our diagnoses and removing things like red man syndrome or whatever that are really offensive, um, you know, Asian flu, et cetera. So this is a rich topic. UC is totally on board and, and I'm very pleased about that. I know we have a long way to go, but very pleased about that. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to um, stop us right here. I wanna thank all the participants. Uh, we've had a very robust uh, attendance and certainly participation. We um, thank both of you for really obviously piquing our interest and in expanding our knowledge. Malcolm, did you want to say anything else? Yeah, I, I would be remiss. I mentioned Kirsten as being a part, but I also want to, I'd be remiss in not acknowledging our chief medical officer, Josh Adler, for really being on board with addressing race in medicine. And, you know, I think without his leadership, we wouldn't have gotten as far as we have. And so um, I, I forgot to acknowledge that. And I just wanted to make sure he and Kirsten were key leaders in this process. Thank you, Malcolm, for that again. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to all of you for participating. With that, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great evening. Thank you.